launching. Welcome to the second panel of our uh, Fulbright Global Webinar Series, Unmasking Inequalities, the Global Impact of COVID-19. My name is Susanne Hamscha. I'm the Regional Diversity Coordinator for Fulbright in Europe and Eurasia. Um, I'm a white woman in my late 30s. I have um, short, dark brown hair and I'm wearing a plain black shirt right now and behind me is a white wardrobe. Um, I'm hosting this series together with my colleagues, Kelly Swayze, the Fulbright Diversity and Inclusion Liaison for East Asia and the Pacific, and Jeremy Gombin Sperling, the Diversity and Inclusion Liaison for the Western Hemisphere, who are not showing on the screen right now, but they're here and, um, and we are organizing um, this panel series together. This panel series is composed of three panels that explore how the COVID pandemic is making patterns of inequality, inequity, and systemic discrimination more visible as communities worldwide are faced with the political, economic, and social implications of the virus. A recording of the first panel of this series is available on our Unmasking Inequalities YouTube channel. We would like to thank the Fulbright Commissions in New Zealand and Mexico and the NEA branch at ECA for their help in organizing this panel. We would also like to thank the Fulbright Commission in Peru for their help in producing our promotional material and our colleagues at the ECA for their support in promoting this panel. This panel today will run for 90 minutes. We will make space for questions during the last section of the panel, but please feel free to post questions and comments in the Q&A box here on Zoom. You can find that at the bottom of your screen or in the comment section if you're watching on YouTube live at any time. Questions submitted through YouTube will be forwarded to the panel as well. I would like to start with a short introduction to the topic of our panel today, which is Forging New Paths, a Feminist Disability Response to COVID. In their 2020 report on COVID-19 at the intersection of disability and gender, Women Enabled International ad identified a gap in initial global responses to COVID-19 in that many actors were discussing how to include women and persons with disabilities in the response, but few were considering the unique experiences of women with disabilities and others living at the intersection of uh, gender and disability. At the same time, organizations of women with disabilities were distressed about the situations in their countries and had concerns about women with disabilities, especially around violence, access to health goods and services, and meeting basic needs. Women and girls with disabilities are subject to intersecting forms of discrimination related to sexual and reproductive health, gender-based violence, legal protection, unpaid care, and domestic work. Women and girls with disabilities who are migrants, refugees, or from ethnic minorities endure even more hardships and unequal treatment. Gender, disability, and structural inequalities which characterized societies before the crisis are being exacerbated by the multifaceted impact of the COVID-19 crisis. Recognizing the specific ways that COVID-19 affects marginalized groups, including disabled people and people of different genders and gender identities is essential to address the impacts of this health emergency. Although there is nothing new about these longstanding patterns of injustice and discrimination, the current situation has amplified inequalities and made even more clear how vulnerable these already marginalized communities are. Marginalized groups have unique vulnerabilities that are not consistently addressed um, or addressed in a global framework and um, policies, and they are being pushed further into the periphery by the global pandemic. A feminist disability critique of uh, structural injustice can be the starting point for the articulation of a just society and an accessible world. Today, we will hear from academics, activists, and healthcare experts who can, um, and what we can learn from looking at this current crisis through a feminist disability lens. Our panelists will discuss the ways in which the COVID-19 pandemic has impacted women and people with disabilities and how they as advocates and activists confront sexism, ableism and other intersecting structures of oppression in formulating responses that center the needs of the most marginalized in their communities. They will address the compounded harms and challenges associated with gender and disability, but also other aspects such as race and ethnicity or socioeconomic factors, for example. 
Their work and experience provides evidence that the most marginalized and vulnerable populations need to be involved in the planning and implementation of government and healthcare responses to COVID-19 if we want to build societies that are just and environments that are accessible and inclusive for all. We hope that listeners joining us today will find this discussion engaging and will be inspired to reflect on what we want our post-pandemic world to look like. So without further ado, I would like to introduce our four fantastic speakers. Um, Katya Dartigas Beauregard, who is a journalist from Mexico City with more than 25 years of experience in various print, online, and television media. She's an activist for the rights of people with disabilities and mother of a 14-year-old with Down syndrome, Ellen. As part of her activism, Katya founded a, a, a nonprofit organization, Comunicación para la Inclusión, Communication for Inclusion, that in 2018 launched Yo Tambien, Discapacidad con todas sus letras, an inclusive and 100% accessible platform that makes journalism about human rights, disability inclusion, and accessibility. She has also worked hand in hand with various organizations of people with disabilities, lobbied successfully for four constitutional reforms and a national law. Katya was also elected to a special Congress in 2016 to write the first constitution of Mexico City. Next up, we have uh, Luma Bashmi, who is a Fulbright scholar, author, and scientific researcher in mental health with a background in communications. Currently, she is the head of scientific research and development and chairperson of the um, Institutional Review Board at King Hamad University Hospital, um, in short, KHUH. As a co-investigator on six KHUH studies, her research topics include integrative oncology services and mind-body interventions, stress and burnout among residents and emergency medicine physicians, and the psychological impact of COVID-19 on healthcare providers. Her department oversees and supports over 60, 60 active studies in medical research at KHUH. Next up, we have Eleanor Lisney, who is a founder member of Sisters of Frida, a disabled women's collective and culture access. She is an access and equality advisor. She is also on the web team of the International Network of Women with Disabilities. As an activist, she writes on intersectional issues as a disabled woman of color and is passionate on campaigning for social justice and inclusion. Eleanor has lived in Malaysia, UK, France, and the US and speaks Cantonese, French, and Malay. And last but not least, we have, we have Elsa Lipscomb, who is a doctoral candidate in the Department of Music at the University of Chicago. She researches at the intersection of sound studies, ethnomusicology, and disability studies, led by a commitment to amplifying disabled voices and moving their perspectives out of the footnotes. In her work, she explores how relationships to time, the body, and the environment are mediated through relationships to sound. Her dissertation, titled Echoes of Silence and Pain, Listening to Viral Acoustomologies, analyzes the sonic profiles of medicalized spaces during the pandemic era and the myriad embodied ways disabled individuals and communities interpret sound and silence. She's the outgoing chair of the Society for Ethnomusicology's Disability and Deaf Studies Special Interest Group and is a current member of the Musicology Now Curatorial, Curatorial Board. Her work has been supported by the Fulbright Association, Fulbright New Zealand, and the Society for Ethnomusicology. So thank you all for um, being here today. To start off, I would like to ask you to share more about your work and background. And I would like to ask you um, if you could talk about what community you come from and work with. And, um, and I would also like to um, talk about what the biggest concern for you or for them, for the communities you work with, um, what the biggest concern is at this moment in the pandemic. Um, Luma, would you perhaps like to start? Thank you so much, Susan, for that great introduction. I really appreciate it. Uh, I would like to first maybe give a little bit of a background on who I am uh, culturally. I'm Bahraini, born and raised. Uh, I do have roots from Saudi Arabia. And again, I'm a female of an ethnic minority to an extent when I lived in the US and the UK. But in Bahrain, I'm an, another Arab citizen. 
And while many other Middle Eastern citizens have you know, the privileges and benefits of uh, any other white person, have the socioeconomic standard of, um, with, of great opportunities and jobs, we also have migrants and refugees and displaced communities where the Middle East represents the biggest population. So we're talking about over 80 million people who are displaced or refugees. And that's one of the populations that my research tends to focus on. So my personal mission became exploring how psychological processes such as stress can influence quality of life, disease and aging. And I specifically uh, focused on Arabic speaking populations, refugees in particular, in communities like Syria, Lebanon and Palestine. So that's just one of the communities I focus on. The second community it tends to be particularly healthcare providers. So we've been looking at emergency care physicians and residents and how stress and burnout affects them, especially during COVID-19. So I hope that's a nice general summary about those two communities. Excellent, thank you so much, Luma. Um, Katya, would you perhaps like to go next? Sure. So uh, as Susan said, I'm, uh, I'm the mother of Adam who has Down syndrome, who has changed my life. I was a journalist prior to his being born, but since he was born, I'm obsessed <laughs> with, um, with the mission of, of taking disability issues to a much greater scene level. You know? So I do journalism about disability inclusion and accessibility. Uh, there is a, a bar that has to be raised a lot because we usually in Mexico forget people with disability. They are so invisible, no? And now, um, for example, um, we are currently concerned about the increase in poverty, the lack of unemployment and the issue that caring for people with disabilities and in, a, in any vulnerable situation, it usually falls back on women. On health issues, vaccination of people with disabilities is not prioritized, and there is not a lot of, of accessible information on the health emergency either. So that's one of the things I've been working on these past year, <laughs> almost a year, you know, making sure that information is accessible. I did... Um, a 60 year, no, 60 day long, uh, small capsule, news capsule that was 100% accessible. Half of the screen was divided uh, with an interpreter of Latin language. The other part was made for, for my, myself or my colleague from Yo Tambien, that we are both journalists. And we made a, a small uh, resume of the day. Uh, and we had also subtitles. And of course, it was all spoken for blind people to, if we, we put on a graph, we described it and so on. It was hugely successful. We had 80 million reproductions and it made the case that accessible information is good for all. Thank you so much, Katya. Um, Ailsa, would you like to go next? Kia ora everyone, my name is Elsa. Um, I am a queer, disabled and chronically ill woman from New Zealand living in Chicago. Um, I am white in my mid-20s. I'm wearing a teal shirt with small black hearts and behind me is a white wall. To my left is my wedding bouquet and to my right is a snapshot of the night sky and a neon sign that says Kia ora love, which means hello love or welcome love in Māori. I am a PhD candidate at the University of Chicago. And so I work within academic communities as an educator and researcher and also as a disability advocate. And in these communities, one of the biggest concerns I have right now is the lack of disabled voices in conversations about COVID-19. Frequently in these conversations, what I'm witnessing is that disabled lives are used to either reassure non-disabled populations, such as when assessing risk factors, or they're used as a warning for what non-disabled populations um, don't wish to become, such as encouraging people to avoid certain behaviors in case they were to become disabled or unwell. In both cases, the actual perspectives of disabled individuals and communities are forgotten and, and made inaudible. 
And one of the things about this dynamic that most interests me is how this lack of disabled voices ultimately constructs narratives about pandemic experiences that harm disabled communities, while also misrepresenting certain pandemic experiences as universal. For instance, I'm sure many of you have heard talk about this being an unprecedented time or experiencing a new world. But when we do that, we actually ignore how disabled communities have been practicing quarantining, masking and social isolation for decades because of inaccessible, inhospitable and unsafe environments. Thank you so much for this. Um, Eleanor, last but not least, would you like to say a couple of words about the communities you work with? Um, I think yes, th thank you for 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 for, for um, doing my background my bio I can call it that. Um, I am a woman of East Asian origin, um, Malaysian Chinese. I have black hair, getting grey. I'm wearing glasses, um, black top with a checkered uh, scarf. And my background is a bookshelf with books and photographs of my children. Um, I was brought up in Malaysia and I went to the UK to do my undergrads. I got married immediately and we moved to France uh, because of my ex-husband's job. Um, and I was a full-time mother for at least 10 years. Um, then I went off to the States and I did my postgraduate, which was in information studies at Austin. So, and then, and then I came back to the UK. I, I only mentioned that because um, it gives me an experience of being disabled and the kind of, a, the kind of um, reception you get in different countries. I think I have the experience of um, well, obviously being an ethnic minority in England, but also in France, where, where it was something that I've never experienced before because my French is terrible. I didn't speak a word of French when I arrived there. And um, how language is important. And I talk about that because of the sort of intersectionality that's important when you're, well, not just when you're a disabled person, but it counts as well as, an, as, as a disabled person. Bec it's not just the fact that I was disabled, but the fact that I didn't speak French very well. So I was put into the sort of status of like a refugee or an immigrant, you know, <laughs> even though my ex-husband was a sort of semi-diplomat and worked in a European institution. But that's the sort of experience which gives me um, a great understanding of the kind of um, injustice you get, not just because you're disabled, but the compound um, injustice you get when you have other um, vulnerability or whatever you want to call it. Uh, in, in the UK, <clears throat> I work with obviously the uh, disabled people's organizations, um, my own Sisters of Frida, uh, which I founded, co-founded, uh, was because we realized there was a gap between women, disabled women and disabled people's organizations. Um, women organizations do, do not often recognize disability and disabled people's organizations do not recognize the issues that disabled women have as, 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 a, as the sort of gender issue. Um, so we've been going for well, a few years and we've been with um, a company, a UK women's organizations to Geneva for um, CEDAW and uh, the Commission for the Status of Women in New York. Um, and so 
in short, we kind of work internationally, nationally, and locally. Um, at the moment, we're, we're running a project on uh, independent living and as with a focus on disabled women. What does independent living mean to disabled women? Um, as for myself, locally, in my own borough in London, I am working on co-production with the council, which is the council of Greenwich, on uh, working together on strategy and, and best methods um, of um, for all sorts of things with, with disabled people, because um, as in everywhere in the world, they want to have cuts, um, cuts in care packages, etc. So that 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 is part of what we do, and uh, yeah, of of course, we are also in touch with the. Um, umbrella groups of disabled people's organizations. And uh, I work a lot on access. I, I have a specialization in accessibility and uh, disability equality, um, working on what they call EDI, equity, um, diversity, and inclusion. For, for funding, uh, funding organizations and stuff. So I, I think <laughs> that's yeah, but no, I'm also very much part of the ethnic minority group. So recently I've done interviews for Black, Black History Month and also interviews for disabled people, the, the, the intersection of being disabled and as a person, people of color. So, um, as an East Asian, the COVID-19 has a special thing because there's been a lot of racism against um, people of kind of East Asian Chinese origin. And um, if you are disabled and that, you can imagine the kind of um, worry when you go out. I will stop there. <laughs> Suzanne, can I say something quickly? Because I'm, I'm sorry, I, I forgot to describe myself. So I'm a white woman with uh, French last names, but really very, very Mexican. And I'm standing in front of also a bookshelf that has, well, books, and particularly Mafalda. Mafalda is a, a cartoon, an Argentinian ca cartoon about a little child that's really fantastic and my role model. And also I have the word laugh because I want to laugh a lot about things. It's like my my mechanism of defense uh, against everything that happens that it's so, well, cruel and, and everything. And also I would like to say that I love, lobby a lot of laws at, at the, well, at the Chamber of Deputies at the Senate, I'm currently doing two of them and also I'm an advisor to the Mexican Supreme Court of Justice in order to advance in the inclusion of people with disabilities inside and outside. And also the communications director of Nosotros that I would like to talk about that a lot because it's a civil um, citizen rights movement that we, we are going to, we're doing a campaign right now parallel to the campaign in Mexico being, being um, we have the, the biggest um, election in history this year in Mexico. So we will be electing all Congress and also 15 governorships, no? And, and we're doing um, a campaign based on human rights, basic human rights. And also, well, talking a lot about um, of course, uh, vaccination for all, um, medicine for all, um, emergency support, um, and also the, the, the thing about caregiving. Caregiving is very important that it will, it, we want it not to rely on women only and to obligate the state or not to take action on that. 
Thank you so much. Um, and you know, I'm sure we will we will come back to um, many of the points you raised in your introductory statements um, in the course of this um, discussion or you know conversation. I hope this is going to be a conversational panel. Um, let me um, you know ask you another fairly general question before we um, move to questions of um, ableism, disability, sexism, and and um, gender inequality in more detail. And, um, and that's the question um, regarding um, the links between this global health crisis um, we're, we're experiencing right now and equity and access issues. Um, as I said in, my, said in my introductory remarks, gender disability um, and structural inequalities have characterized um, societies already before this pandemic, but you know these um, inequalities are being exacerbated by the impact that um, the COVID-19 crisis has had. Um, so what are the links between this global health crisis, equity and access issues um, in your um, professional context, in your um, social context? Um, Luma, perhaps you would like to start um, responding to this question. Yes, thank you, Susan. I also wanna just give a, big, a quick background on myself. So I'm wearing a white blazer. I have long brown hair and I have a meshrabiya, which is a traditional window, Arabic window, as well as in Middle Eastern art painting. Uh, and I also co-founded and now direct Ila Beirut, which is an initiative to provide free mental health care for women, men, young children, as well as members of the LGBT plus communities and refugee communities following the August 2020 explosion in Lebanon. So with an international network of 25 mental health care providers, to date we've helped over 20 people receive support for trauma and other stressors related to COVID as well as economic crisis, warfare, displacement and resettlement in Beirut specifically. So to cover your question, uh, Suzanne, I think there are several marginalized communities that we have really discussed and talked about, but I'll cover a few from the aspect of my research. The first is ethnic minorities. The second is people of refugees affected by war, conflict and displacement. And the third is healthcare providers and frontline workers. So I think it's important to point out that COVID-19 exposed a lot of weaknesses in the healthcare systems around the world. And in particular, ethnic minorities with racism cases being documented more than ever in the United States and worldwide, it's really important for us to cover it. So we need to highlight uh, what other aspects in which racism has negatively affected people's quality of life. And it's no surprise that ethnic health disparities come along quite often, especially amongst African-Americans, uh, Latinos, and people from Native American backgrounds, as well as other ethnic minorities like Arabs. So when it does, what it does is trickle down to health too. And some of the research points to how African-Americans, Latinos, and ethnic minorities were hit hardest by COVID-19. So an African-American is more likely to catch the virus, 2.4 times more likely, and 2.4 more likely times to die than white people, and 2.2 times more likely to, die, to be affected and die than Asians and Latinos. So what are uh, ethnic health disparities? I just want to define that for our audience. So that means differences in health outcomes that occur because of ethnicity, but it's also due to higher risk, socioeconomic disadvantages and discriminations that are unjust and avoidable. So let me just give a context. And I tend to speak using references of the US and UK, but I will come back to the Middle East. So for example, in the US in 1899, you had the infant mortality rates were almost twice as high among blacks as they were among whites. And now it's almost 2.2 times higher. And people tend to ask, is it really that bad? Are they really that affected? Maybe it's just their lifestyle habits. Maybe they're not eating well. Uh, maybe they're not educated enough to know better. So African-Americans are disproportionately suffering from leading causes of morbidity and mortality. We're talking about cardiovascular disease. We're talking about cancer and preterm birth. So when they get impacted by underlying health conditions that are linked to poverty, they tend to be linked to also face discrimination in medical care. 
they're more likely to work jobs that require them to leave the house. And when they have those chronic illnesses, they tend to be linked with their poverty aspects and structural racism, which I'll get into that. So that tends to get, lead them to have more serious forms of COVID-19 disease. So for example, I'll just, and it's kind of ideal that Elsa is also in Chicago or studying for, in the University of Chicago, but you must know that 68% of the COVID-19 deaths in Chicago were African-Americans and they only make up 30% of the population. And that same ratio was reported in many other states too. So at this point, I think we're all wondering why is this happening and how is it happening? Um, and it goes back to the term of structural inequalities. So people with lower income, especially common among ethnic minorities, tend to have less financial security, less access to quality healthcare, uh, less access to education, and less access to healthy, affordable foods. And there's, there's a very famous research study that was con uh, conducted by the Bill Gates Foundation, which looked at 160 countries and how they ate and how much it costs to eat healthy. So they came up with an average cost of $2.48 a day to eat healthy. But they also realized that that exceeded household per capita income for at least 1.58 billion people. So while we say that we have around what 8 billion people around the world, at least two of those, 2 billion of those can't afford to eat healthy. And we all know that nutrition is a big aspect of maintaining a healthy um, attitude, quality of life and just uh, physical health. So when you live with places that don't offer you medical insurance, where you don't have a test center next to you, you're less likely to detect the disease and you're less likely to get it treated in advance. You're also less likely to afford medical testing and treatment. And there are other aspects. So it's not just physical access. You also have psychological aspects to it. So for example, African-Americans and other ethnic minorities, and I'm talking worldwide as well, tend to think that their symptoms are not believed as much by professionals or don't get adequately treated by a professional. So let's say in the case of pain, they get undertreated or they get different treatments for that purpose, which goes to show again and reflect on the large number of community ethnic minorities that are affected by COVID-19. So just to recap on how this happens, uh, food deserts, low access to healthcare, expensive health insurance, low socioeconomic status, education, exposure to racism and epigenetics. Epigenetics, uh, just to give a background as well to the audience, tends to be how we carry the genes and how they're passed on from other generations to the next, describe how we uh, use them. So we could be carrying the uh, gene for cancer, but we don't actually uh, show that or reflect it in our lifestyle or lifetime because we maintain a healthy lifestyle, we're educated about avoiding things that cause that risk of getting cancer. Uh, but back to marginalized communities, these are all factors that affect them. And I'm just going to touch basically on other aspects that affect refugees before I give the platform to someone else. But I think it's important to also think about people who are affected by war, conflict, and displacement. So apart from being affected by COVID-19, they're worried about finding a new home, resettling, um, Beirut specifically and Syria and Yemen are going through huge economic crises and Beirut recently went through an extreme uh, bomb explosion that has put 300,000 people displaced and 200 killed. So when you think about all these different communities, there are other factors involved such as income loss, unemployment that has pushed many migrants to return home instead of staying where they are to continue working and supporting their families. And while their incomes are being reduced, that also affects their families back home. So you have a lot of, for example, uh, migrant workers from India and Pakistan who would be working in the Middle East. And when their income is reduced because of you know, restrictions to mobility, they can't afford to send remittances to their families back home. And they tend to also live in very congested spaces. So let's say, for example, five to 10 of those migrant workers live together in one small apartment with a shared bathroom, they're 10 times as much likelier to be at risk for COVID. They don't have a safe space to self-isolate. 
and they can't avoid infecting the spread. So there are many aspects and many factors that involve and affect these marginalized communities. And I think um, as we, we were discussing before we started that many countries are taking different approaches, but others are neglecting. And I think that we need to really look at how a health equity and healthcare um, go hand in hand because these issues have been underlying and been there for a very long time and COVID-19 has just exposed them to the light. Thank you. Thank you so much, Luma. Um, is there anyone else on the panel who would like to respond? You can just unmute yourself. I'm gonna give you a second. Um, if not, I would uh, like to move to sort of the, the next section um, regarding ableism and, and gender inequality more specifically. Um, and, you know, Luma has raised um, a couple of really important points in, in her remarks um, just now. And again, you know, I think a lot of this um, we will come back to um, in this next sort of block of questions. Um, and the, uh, the first question that I would like to pose to this panel um, regards, um, again, sort of the, the clinical and public health context. Um, and I would like to ask you how ableism plays out in clinical and public health contexts um, and what the ethical implications are of protocols for resource allocation and order of treatment. Um, there is a lot of talk in the media and, you know, um, just out there um, in, in the public um, regarding triage protocols. Um, so I would like to pose this question to the panel and um, ask Elsa perhaps to um, respond to this question first. Thank you, Susanna. I think this is such an important question to be talking about and to be highlighting. And it, specifically because echoing what um, the opening remarks on this panel discussed, Ableism within clinical and public health context didn't suddenly appear at the onset of COVID-19. Disabled and chronically ill communities have faced centuries of discrimination within healthcare contexts that are then being exasperated during this current moment. And examples of this are um, disabled populations being denied treatment or denied a voice when creating treatment plans or constructing illness narratives. But they've also been asked or forced to toe this line between being sick enough that they are considered worthy of receiving care, but not so sick that they're then considered a lost cause or unworthy investing within. And these ableist attitudes don't exist in isolation. It's important to talk about the ways that they play out within a network of intersectional identities. So we are homophobic, racist, fatphobic, classist, and sexist attitudes intersect with ableist attitudes to establish protocols that then devalue disabled lives. They also inspire various attitudes about certain bodies and diagnoses that are then taught both implicitly and explicitly in classrooms and labs and used within textbooks. And all of this, then we can trace within it how discriminatory practices and attitudes become normalized and standardized within healthcare contexts. You may have seen that throughout the COVID-19 pandemic, there's been talk of what's called ICUgenics, which is an amalgamation of the ICU, so the intensive care unit, and eugenics protocols. And what we're seeing is that disabled individuals or parents of disabled children are being asked to surrender their personal medical equipment that keeps them alive and improves quality of life or asked to sign DNRs, so do not resuscitate orders, in order to then prioritize saving non-disabled lives. And in these in, like situations and scenarios, when it comes to types of resource allocation and crisis triaging, what it often comes down to is a question of which lives are considered worth saving. And when this question is asked, Behind it, I think there's a slightly different question, but that's worth naming, which is which lives are considered worth living? Because when determining who to save, implicitly under the surface are discussions about which life would be more productive within a capitalist society and what types of lives are considered worthy or full 
And disabled lives do not fare well within this formulation and within these discussions. Thank you so much, Elsa. Um, is there anyone who would like to respond to Elsa's remarks immediately? Yes, yes. I want to echo a lot of things that I Elsa has said because I, I see it on a daily basis in my work. Um, I think uh, this pandemic has been a magnifying glass for pre-existing in inequalities. And of course, if, if you want to see it, it's a very great important uh, um, opportunity for, for empathy because yes, people with disabilities have lived in lockdown and they have been excluded from, I don't know how much time, no? And in Mexico, it's very hard to raise awareness of this because I'm very envious of, of the, all the data Luma has. We do not have that data. We do not know if, if people with disabilities have, uh, well, we, we suppose, but we don't know because they don't ask or register if a person who has COVID-19 and who has died of COVID-19 has a disability or that doesn't have a disability. But it, it's also in, in everyday life in Congress, just to give you one example. There, we are currently lobbying uh, at the Senate for a reform that will provide more resources for shelters to protect women who are victims of violence. Most of them are not accessible. And there is a bylaw, for instance, that established that when a woman with a psychosocial disability requires services, she will immediately re be referred to a psychiatric center. When she was originally looking for support, they respond with greater violence. The regular response for women experimenting violence is to call a phone number. What about the deaf women who claim their right to speak Mexican language? In Mexico, there is a slogan regarding violence against women. You are not alone and I'm quoting it, no? But in the case of women with disabilities, this is not true. They are very, very much alone. Even now, the Mexican government recently passed a law that can be still stopped by the Senate and we're adv advocating for it because they have merged mental health services and programs to prevent addictions in the same area as an effort to reduce costs in, instead of investing more in the subject. We believe that they are absolutely different things that should be treated differently. The proposal, for, for example, validates involuntary hospitalization and treatment for people with psychosocial disabilities institutions in institutions without informed consent. This is like basic human rights. No? And also we are very concerned about the burnout of caregivers, people that care for the daily needs of people with disabilities who are usually mothers and women who are their nurses without training or payment. Many of them also have had to quit their jobs in order to take care of the person in the family that needs it. And it reduces the income of a family who needs more resources and not less. As you mentioned, um, healthcare providers and um, you know the, the toll that you know this pandemic is taking on them. Um, let me ask how COVID nineteen has affected healthcare providers and what is being done to protect them, not only from COVID infections, obviously, but also from burnouts, um, mental health crises, and trauma. Um, I know Luma, you have a lot of experience um, in this area. So maybe you would like to say a couple of words. Yes, thank you, Susan. Um, I wanted to also touch on what Katya was saying about um, the lack of statistics on ethnic minorities, on healthcare providers and on people with disabilities. Um, in our region in the Middle East, we actually lack it as much as you do in Mexico. Um, and I think the problem is that recognizing uh, different nationalities and their needs means having to actually step up and do something about it. And when governments need to allocate their resources to that, that becomes also problematic. So one of the studies that we actually did at our hospital in Bahrain recently uh, was looking at how, uh, what the psychological impact of COVID-19 was on their anxiety levels of healthcare workers at our medical center. 
And as you know, we all realize that this is a global health crisis with a likely very long-term psychological impact on frontliners, emergency residents, and so forth. So there were a few studies that were carried out in Oman, Jordan, Saudi, Palestine, and Iran, but this is the first one that happened in Bahrain. And based on the literature, we saw that uh, post-traumatic stress disorder, anxiety, depression, high stress levels were the most commonly reported amongst them worldwide and in the Middle East region. And obviously we all know that during the peak of COVID, so around February and March, when nobody really understood what it was and how to treat it, uh, there was no mention of a vaccine, the stress levels were high. However, we did our study in July and August of 2020, and we are repeating this study um, currently just to compare how those uh, differences are in anxiety levels and stress. And our study had a self-report survey. We measured both anxiety and impact of events scale, which means the level of potential post-traumatic stress disorder or PTSD. So the results we came about is that around 19% of healthcare workers reported mild to positive PTSD and around 31% reported mild to severe anxiety. But those who were younger, age 20 to 29, those who were single, and those who had sleep-related disturbances were more likely to have higher anxiety levels and PTSD. Uh, those who were smokers and those who also underwent quarantine, whether or not they were at risk for COVID, were more likely to report higher levels of anxiety. And when you think about it, these factors can uh, imply or affect and relate to any uh, individual from a mar marginalized community. So some of the significant predictors we saw of psychological distress was actually sleep disturbances and or whether or not you actually were infected by COVID-19, as well as being young and being a smoker. But again, going back to your question, Susan, of how can we actually do, what can we do to protect those healthcare providers, not just from infection, but from burnout, mental health and mental health crises and stress? Um, we noticed that overall our results were slightly lower than the rest of the healthcare workers in China, Europe and the US. And when we explored it further in our hospital, we found a few explanations that may have been attributed to that reason. So the first was we actually provided ready access to psychological support services to the healthcare workers. So that meant that they were being received, appreciated and acknowledged for their efforts. Uh, they had a psychological support hotline that they could access at any time that their leaders or bosses were unaware of. So they could do it in anonymity and confidentially. And they were always provided with the latest updates and facts on COVID-19 regularly through online weekly lectures that we would host, email circulars, and making sure that they would have informed decisions when dealing with challenging situations. Again, we also worked closely with the Bahrain National Task Force for combating the coronavirus. So we had best practice protocols and guidelines which were developed and updated on a regular basis. While I'm saying it wasn't always perfect, I think we had very strict lockdown measures that were very much just recently loosened up within after eight to nine months. And to this day, we do go back and forth with, with restrictions, but I feel that a lot of it came from having community buy-in and building trust with the community to listen to the government about those restrictions. Um, other countries like the UAE and France actually have gifted frontline workers with citizenships or golden visas, as well as setting up uh, solid shift systems that resemble ED units or emergency units, just to make sure that the timing is offered to make sure that they're well rested. And many programs like the Oman Residency Program offer wellness programs for their staff just to make sure that they are catered to and that they're given mandatory leave as well as guidance and counseling. So those are just some of the findings that we explored during this time. Thank you so much. Um, this, is, this is really great. Um, I, I have another question that has to do with the um, healthcare context, but it focuses more on access to healthcare per se. Um, and um, I would I would like to ask Eleanor perhaps to respond to this question. Um, you know, disabled people, and we've talked about the importance of intersectionality as well. So not only disabled people, but also um, other communities, people of color, trans people, queer people, 
have been at the front lines of coordinating COVID-19 mutual aid groups um, all over the world. Um, and I would like to ask you how factors such as unaffordability, attitudinal barriers, inaccessibility to healthcare facilities, and lack of alternative means to access public health information and communication, how has that impeded access to healthcare in, uh, in your context? And as I said, Eleanor, maybe you would like to respond first and then um, the rest of the panel, if they wanna respond as well, that would be great. That's a lot of questions. Um, first of all, um, I, can I start with the uh, disaggregation of data and, and, and that is also not in the UK, although, although I think we do keep a good record but, um, of uh, maybe more of ethnic minorities than we do of disabled people. Um, specifically, I want to say is that I don't know for the rest of the world so much, but in the UK, very often as people of uh, disabled communities, we say that you self-identify yourself as disabled. And in the UK, if you are diabetic, you are disabled. If you are, if you, you know, I know other countries as well, but I know in some countries like dyslexia, dyspraxia is not included. So I think all those kind of things makes makes a difference when it comes to data. You know, um, I wanted to talk about um, uh, earlier on, um, Luna talked about healthcare people. Um, because of that, I can say that healthcare people in the UK, a lot of them are done by, uh, are, are done, are, uh, the workers are of ethnic minorities, like Filipinos, for example, or, or from the Indian um, continent. And, and you can't just sort of separate healthcare professionals and disabled people because a lot of people who are unofficial carers or healthcare professionals may also be disabled. So that's where the sort of intersectionality comes in because when we, we talk about disability in the UK, we're very much pan impairment. So includes the psychosocial, the men, people with mental health, older women, older people, you know, etc. cetera. Um, where COVID-19 is concerned, and I, th I think this uh, webinar is also about feminism, um, I can add a note that it's harder for women to access healthcare, for example, smear tests, for example, you know, sort of tests for cancer and stuff like that because of inaccessible healthcare, um, because they, the, the, the hospital, the, the facilities are not accessible. So um, there's been a report in the newspapers that uh, a lot of uh, disabled women were missed out. Um, there is an, another thing, um, which is um, a campaign led by one of my friends, very strongly about letting personal assistance uh, in hospitals. So because of COVID-19, the um, medical facilities have said that you cannot take a personal assistant or a carer. Uh, I, think, I think you call them care something care in America I can't remember now a caretaker yeah um you can't take one with you to hospital but on the other hand the nurses are too busy to attend to you if you can't eat food yourself if you can't move you know what how are you going to do it so there was a huge kind of campaign and I, I think they they have allowed um um help us into the hospital. And this includes husbands and includes, you know, I have friends, non-disabled friends who, you know, went into hospital 
to give birth and their husbands were not allowed to go with them and they were left to fend with the babies on their own. So um, those are sort of uh, feminist issues and but added to that for people in the UK there's the added complication of Brexit which means that a lot of personal assistance of people who help disabled people you know with care packages and things come from Eastern Europe and they were not um, there was a, there, there's a problem because Eastern Europeans were suddenly you know they had they can't stay so what do you do when you know if, if, if all your care is being taken is being done by Eastern Europeans what are you going to do you know it's not the, the trouble with it, it's it's hard enough to hire somebody a caretaker a personal assistant but when COVID is it's even more difficult um I, I can't talk about sort of like the big picture like Luna did but I can tell you what happens on the ground which is more grassroots and which is what more disabled people campaign against is things like suddenly it's hard enough to hire a personal assistant and suddenly you have to think about your safety which means that they shouldn't take public transport which means that if they come from a house that have multiple uh, tenants that puts them at risk and puts you at risk so you can't hire them you know and and all this is exacerbated so what, what, what do you do how can you you know and without care how are you going to do anything you know it's like going shopping it's like preparing food you know we, we talk um i think is it luna who spoke about eating healthily we're not even talking about eating healthily we're just talking about being able to eat not because you haven't got money because you can't access the food because it's away in the supermarket, you can't get there because you don't have somebody to help you to go and get there and then prepare the food. You know, this is the sort of things that happen. And um, when it comes to, okay, the sort of feminism thing is that people still expect women to be able to cook. They still expect women to have all this um, sort of feminine jobs like caretaking for children like you know and 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 cooking and things um so there is a huge impact on disabled mothers um suddenly um they can't even have the maybe small amount of time that they can when they have babysitters or you know, uh, they take it to a childcare facility. They can't have that. And if they're of a low social economic um, status, they might have a very small flat, a very small apartment, and they have just children all the time with them now. And added to that, um, I think somebody mentioned violence against women, there's domestic violence. And in the case of domestic violence, it's very often that non-disabled men get custody of the children. And if domestic abuse happens, the social worker don't all is not always aware. They 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 this is ableism. They think that a non-disabled person it's more likely to, to is more capable of, of childcare. So, you know, it happens. And so what happens is the, the person, the woman who has domestic abuse does not report it because they know the risk that they have that their children might be taken away from them. Uh, I think I'll stop there. <laughs> Thank you so much, Eleanor. Um, yeah, 
um, I, I don't even know how to how to respond to everything you just said. Um, very, very powerful. Um, is there anyone else who would like to respond or react to Eleanor's comments? Yes, I, I see it all the time here in Mexico. And also, well, you know, this a huge gap that has the, all the governments have uh, like forgotten that has been filled in by my disabled people organizations or their allies like us, no? Uh, for example, um, we don't have really um, interpreters in, in, in healthcare facilities uh, for deaf people. So um, um, interpreters have an improvised call center that they donate their work in case someone from the deaf community wants to communicate with a doctor or a nurse. I'm, I'm also very worried about access to education. The response that was given by the Ministry of Education here in Mexico was, of course, uh, television programs that didn't have also uh, interpreters in sign language or subtitles, and they were um, excluding a lot of people. We have not been able to solve it yet. I think it, this is a global issue, and, and we also need to think and rethink about what should be done to meet the specific needs of students with disabilities who have often been excluded from education, much more if they have, like Eleanor said, uh, a need for greater support such as personal assistance, an intellectual disability or autism. No? So uh, we are very worried and working on it. And also about the access to, once again, information. No? The, we, in Yotamin, we also did uh, last year a series of, of seven practical guidelines for people with disabilities, motor, visual, hearing, um, psychosocial, also people with autism, elderly people, and an easy uh, to read guide for people with intellectual disabilities. And they contain information of accessible resources that, and we made them with, with um, everyone uh, with different organizations that that are specialized in it in each case no um so it is in our webpage it's jotambien.mx i will put it on the chat right now and it's in spanish but you can download it and traduce it and do whatever if i think they are very they were they were checked by people with each of their disabilities and and they contain resources that are good for all thank you so much katya and i i also see that uh, luma has unmuted herself would you like to respond as well luma yes please uh i just wanted to comment on both uh katya and Eleanor's comments regarding how the situation is when you talk about being on ground. And I totally agree what's painted in the research and what we see isn't necessarily what is practiced. And from my own experience working with the Bahrain Paralympic Committee uh, before and during COVID-19, um, their ultimate aim was to just facilitate and sort of empower people with impairment to join sports and improve their quality of life. Um, locally and just engage them in activities that would promote social inclusion and uh, building community groups for them. So when COVID hit, a lot of that was affected. And as you guys already mentioned that the dis people with disabilities tend to need a larger community around them to support them. And when you create that limitation of restrictions and social exclusion or um, limitations to the number of people, that becomes a little more challenging. So for example, here in Bahrain, uh, the para-athletes that we've had, they've had to stop or pause on their training, which affects their daily life, since that tends to be what motivates them. And we've had, as you know, worldwide tournaments being cancelled, including those of para-athletes, such as the Paralympics, along with the Olympics in Beijing. Um, so that affects countries' economies, they affect the athletes. I know that in Bahrain locally, we wanted to host at least two regional and two international tournaments, and we've had to put those on pause. And from those tournaments, they were planning on funding and supporting like different hotels and um, facilities to upgrade to make them disability friendly. And that's been put on pause. 
So that as well as the repetition of PCR testing and this constant fear that we live in of being infected just affects a para athletes performance, their training, their psycho mindset, and they don't get to hang out with their teams as much. So the interactions, the gatherings when they're trying to train really affects the harmony and the spirit as well as the social support network that they have. So like all of us, but more so for people with disabilities, um, our interactions and their interactions have become more online, which uh, basically resulted in a loss of human touch and physical affection. Thank you, Luma. Um, Elsa, I, I see that you also left um, a couple of really important comments in the chat, and I would like to ask you if you want to um, elaborate on those comments, but perhaps also um, talk about, um, because that's that's also something you, you mentioned in your comment um, about, um, you know, 60% of um, COVID deaths um, being disabled individuals in the UK. Um, I wanna um, give you also the opportunity to talk about um, death rates in institutional um, settings um, specifically. Um, you know, um, we, we see and, and hear and, and read um, in the media that, um, you know, hospitals are very often likened also to front lines and, and war zones and there is limited capacities um, in hospitals. So, you know, public spaces have to be transformed or converted into care facilities. So, you know, the, um, the discourse on medical and medicalized spaces, I think is um, very interesting to talk about in the, in the context of this pandemic. Um, so, you know, maybe you would like to connect the comments that you left in the chat um, to, this, um, to this question. Thank you. Um, so what I wrote in the chat for those who that may be unaccessible to was that this dynamic that Eleanor was describing that then the other panelists have kind of jumped off of is also another way in which we can understand and witness how restrictions and shelter in place directives are often constructed or implemented with a normate or a normative body and life in mind, which means that the particularities of disabled lives, particularly in how they are constructed Constructed intradependently means that they are not taken into consideration when these strict lockdowns or measures go into place. A really um, easy and quick example of this is when you limit who can enter or in exit a home, suddenly that then really throws into question, well, what about people who rely on care workers or additional support in the home? And then the risk that that poses with those people being itinerant or transitory, working in multiple different homes, and then coming into um, vulnerable populations homes, yet without that care, they're left without necessary supports. Um, but this question of the death rate, so I noted in the chat that 60% of individuals who have died in the UK from COVID are identified as disabled. And yet what we're really seeing is that there's a discrepancy between who this is disproportionately affecting and then who the various like vaccine distribution efforts are being directed towards. And we can see, especially here within the United States, there is a lack of attention being given to the distribution of vaccines to disabled individuals particularly in the construction of high risk being associated with over 65 years. There's almost this ignorance or lack of awareness of how you can be high risk and young. And this just assumption that if you were to offer the vaccine to older populations, it's a catch all and covers vulnerable populations at the same time. And yet we just know that a huge portion of people who are disabled or live with comorbidities or chronic illnesses that make them at higher risk are under the age of 65. And yet in states like California, they are being told that the rollout of vaccines will be done purely on age now with none of the factors of um, comorbidity taken into consideration. Um, and this question of medicalization, what I find really interesting about it is that it actually gestures towards and speaks to the types of changes that we should be thinking about in a post-COVID world. Once COVID, the kind of like immediacy of it has dissipated or been controlled, 
the ways in which we now talk about medical facilities and understand medical facilities are not going to suddenly disappear. The changes that have taken place, the associations and meanings that have become associated with these spaces won't simply revert back to a pre-COVID state at, you know, the point at which all restrictions are lifted. In my own research, I have been identifying and observing a process that I refer to as the medicalization of the everyday, whereby traditionally non-medical spaces and environments have become associated with or saturated by behaviors and sights and sounds that have historically been more tied to traditional medical facilities. And by that, I'm talking about like doctor's clinics, hospital wards, emergency rooms, places like that. And this is occurring in a number of different ways. We're seeing, for instance, the transformation of public spaces, such as parking garages, churches, and stadiums and convention centers being transformed into hospitals, COVID testing centers, and now we're also seeing vaccination clinics in those sites. And as an ethnomusicologist, I also think a lot about this in terms of the sounds we're exposed to and the frequency with which we hear them, such as encountering the sights and sounds of medical environments such as alarm bells in our homes through news media and at home medical monitoring due to the overrunning of hospital facilities. So being sent home and asked to monitor your O2 levels and your stats instead of remaining within a medical facility to do so. And this has been further exasperated by everyday sounds it being um, associated and taking on newly medicalized meanings. Um, in my own research, I've been interviewing a lot of people and one of the most common associations they now talk about is how the sound of their doorbell now inspires these medicalized actions and reactions, such as immediately moving to a mask, immediately getting hand sanitizer, and then being really concerned about the risk of exposure through interacting with someone new. And so that type of association, that moment of fear that kicks in the moment the doorbell is sounded, isn't going to simply go away as we move forward. So what that really for me speaks to is that these associations that people have developed aren't going to revert back to this pre-COVID state, which then raises really important questions for how our generations will interact with and within medical spaces in the future. But the second point that I want to raise here is that this kind of medicalization is also not completely new. For many disabled and chronically ill communities, there has never existed a super clear line or divide between what is or is not a medical space. Homes have always been extensions of medical clinics. Bedrooms have become infusion centers. Church parking lots have always been blood sugar testing sites. These spaces have always existed for disabled and chronically ill communities as both medical and public or non-medical. And so it also comes back once again to an earlier point that I raised, which is how dominant narratives of the pandemic erase disabled experiences, but also could benefit and profit from learning from the disabled experience and understanding the long term repercussions of this moment in our history. Sorry, I just want to tell Ayosa that I nodded all the time that you talked. <laughs> I think we were we were all nodding. Um, no, but thank you so much, Elsa, and you know, thank you also for uh, mentioning how important it is that we also um, try to look ahead. And you know, we have, I think, ten to fifteen minutes to now, um, you know, talk about the future and um, how we envision a, po a post-pandemic world. And um, you know, I, I would like to return to the very um, topic of this panel, and that is the feminist disability lens. Uh, through which we can look at COVID-19 and ask you um, on the panel how, first of all, a feminist disability response uh, to COVID-19 could inform um, the building of resilience against future emergencies, um, but then obviously also just in general, what can be our takeaways, what can we learn from looking at, at this specific pandemic through a um, feminist disability lens. Um, and maybe Katya, um, you would like to go first. Oh, well, sure. I, I would like to call for a major interaction of, of organized um, groups of people with uh, disability and also other minorities that have been excluded. I think we have to make a front 
a better front in order to represent all of us much better. Um, and, and I would also like to, to, to tell you a little bit about the campaign that we're launching, that we launched last uh, Sunday, that's called, it's a citizen movement called Nosotros. That means us, no? Not you, not me, not them, us, all of us, no? And that, that would be the translation. And we launched a campaign last Sunday that we run parallel to the elections um, that I, I, I said at the beginning of, of the webinar that are the biggest ones in history in Mexico. In, nos, in Nosotros, our campaign is designed to promote five axes with punctual demands in this pandemic and beyond, no? To empower citizens in order for them to demand in front of all the candidates and the future governments. And one of our slogans is that we want life to be, <laughs> to be just possible. No? And the five axes are, of course, medicines for all and COVID vaccines. They also, they have not prioritized in Mexico, as Ailsa said, and also, I don't know, I think uh, that people with disabilities Particularly, I know this very well because I'm a mother of a, of a teenager with Down syndrome, do have more risk of, of getting COVID and dying about it, no? Um, and we're making, a, you know, letters to the Secretary of Health and raising awareness in the media. It's been hard. The second X is an emergency living income for people who are unemployed or who now work more and earn less. The third one is um, the issue of caring for people that should not fall back only on women. The fourth is decent work, especially focused on people who work on digital platforms and domestic work workers. Here in Mexico, uh, there are 2 million women, particularly that do domestic work, that they do not have social services at all or contracts or anything. No? And five, the culture of peace to avoid political polarizations that are putting democracies all over the world in danger. No? Nosotros is, um, uh, it, it was born four years ago and is represented in almost all the states in Mexico, which are 32, and trains people to know their rights and defend them. We say that together, all together, we can better demand these and, and and these from who are responsible of giving them, no? Thank you so much. And, you know, obviously I would also like to give the other panelists a chance to respond, but perhaps um, already tied us to my next question, which regards um, some of the um, practical steps that can be taken, concrete steps that can be taken, practical changes we can make um, to promote access, whether that's to healthcare, um, but also education, information, institutions in, in your specific region. We also have a question from the audience that um, kind of, you know, ties into this question, which um, we will get to in a moment, but maybe just, you know, first in, in general, um, what are some of the steps that we can take um, to, to promote access? Um, Luma, maybe you would like to um, address this from your perspective, and then um, we will give the rest of the panel a chance to also respond. Thank you, Susan. Uh, I think that's a really important question. And we tend to, when we say practical changes, a lot of people think this will be challenging. We need to hold stakeholders and in government institutions accountable. And in this case, I think there, it's multi-fronted. So the first I think, and I think many of us on the panel have mentioned this is transparency and sharing the data and statistics on marginalized communities who are affected. So we tend to not hear about uh, ethnic minorities, refugees, people with disabilities, and displaced people, and how they've been affected by the pandemic. So disease-wise, job loss-wise, mortality, morbidity, whether they have the help they need, whether they're getting vaccinated. If we get more stats on this, that will inform us on how to function best and move forward. And next, I think I remember reading um, a bit of research on how females, Latinos and Blacks were the most likely to lose their jobs during the pandemic. But that's because women were reporting it to organizations so that they could get the information out there. So it tends to be that grassroots communities are the ones putting the word out and informing the public. And then again, going with um, 
reports of how ethnic communities, people with impairment, the data tends to be very low. So I think identifying key stakeholders and holding them accountable is important. And I'm talking about not just government officials, about sharing, being transparent, but also um, having international agencies agree that, for example, schools, hospitals, community groups, uh, places of worship and religion all play a part in informing and also being responsible. And what does that look like for us? Um, I think education, which can be very lacking for people with disabilities and refugees, is a big one. So offering communities or spaces that we can reuse, so for example, conference halls or um, big university spaces and hospitals that can be reused as outdoor spaces to maintain this, whether it's for testing sites, vaccination sites, that would make a huge difference in protecting and maintaining their healthcare and giving them access as well as information. Um, on an individual basis, we actually always downplay what we can do. Uh, I'm not speaking about the panel because they have such amazing accomplishments and it's an honor to speak with them. But I think for the rest of us who always wonder like, how can I help? It's as small as just wearing a mask, maintaining social distancing, trying to avoid attending gatherings that are larger than five or six, unless you live in a home and really present and report your system, uh, symptoms if you have them and get vaccinated if it's possible for you. I know that all, all countries offer vaccinations, but in the Middle East, in parts of Europe, they're offering it um, full time for free in some instances. And so when people question the validity of a vaccine, I think they need to understand the science behind a model of a vaccine and that it's been tested for decades. And um, we're actually more likely to be affected in a negative way if we get COVID versus actually getting the vaccine. So it's our duty as people who are abled in a sense, like even though I have a chronic disease, I'm still consider myself able. And I took the vaccine because I know that I was protecting those who can't take it. And that way we can protect them in the long term and make that faster. And I would just want to comment briefly on Bahrain as well, and it's being a having a very diverse society. So we have uh, Jews, Muslims, Christians, we have people from Southeast Asia, from Europe, from America, um, and Europe and all parts of the world. And I think that one of the things that were so effective about the COVID-19 vaccine campaign and lockdown was how they communicated and how they bought in and engaged with the community. So. They used um, vacant schools, training organizations and conference halls to use as testing sites. They translated all their content about lockdown information, just general COVID-19 info and regulations, as well as how to get vaccinated in as many languages as possible. And they put them in locations where they would be living in, where they could see it um, in social media platforms that they often use, with, which tends to be Facebook. And last, I think that if you can't engage with your community and you can't build your trust with them and show that um, you are figuring it out, but you're also being as transparent as possible and repeating that message, I don't think you're going to be as effective in reaching out and being practical in those changes. So understanding the cultural nuances and understanding that, for example, cultural societies such as the Middle East versus individualistic societies such as America and the UK will function differently. You notice that many people were not as adhering to the rules in the US and UK, and I don't blame the people, of course, there were a lot of miscommunication about the rules of lockdown. But at the same time, when you confuse people and they have this independent mindset and they've lost trust in their government and healthcare providers, um, it's less likely to be effective that they listen to what you have to say. So listening and understanding your target audience is so important. Thank you. Thank you so much, Luma. Um, Elsa, I would also like to give you a chance to respond to the question of, of access and promoting access. And I would also like to um, you know, forward the question that we received through the um, Q&A box to you. And I will just read out um, the question and ask you um, perhaps if you can respond. So this member from our audience writes, I am a member of my university's Access for All Forum, which is a part of our equality, diversity and in inclusivity initiative. In what ways can universities support students and staff during the pandemic and onward, especially with respect to virtual classrooms and meetings? How can we in effectively inform the community about issues surrounding disability? Are required trainings helpful? 
or does this typically become something people just do and then ignore or forget soon after returning to status quo? Thank you. So I'll first address this question and then I'm going to transition into thinking about digital solutions, specifically in the work environment and academic settings, because I think this question really neatly ties into also thinking about what it looks like going forth. Um, so in general, I think these types of trainings have the potential to do really important work within our institutions, specifically in the ways that they often name and claim various disparities of access that for many people remain invisible and inaudible. Frequently what I hear within academic institutions is that until either a educator is um, working with a student who requires a particular access need or alternatively until someone themselves requires that need, they're completely unaware of the ways in which classroom and education settings can become really inaccessible and inhospitable to different types of students and different types of learning models. So I often think that the work these trainings do, do something really important, which is to purely get it onto people's radars, that these are issues that every educator and every administrator should be thinking about as they construct different types of learning environments. In general though, I think that often these work most effectively when aimed at a much more local level, rather than instituting like a university-wide training that everyone does the same one. Oftentimes I think they're most effective when tailored to a particular department or a particular level of administration because different experiences at the university are determined by the environments that they're working within. And one example would be, for instance, as a music student and a music teacher, one thing my students have been particularly concerned about within the remote learning environment is about music practice. Many of them don't have access to their own pianos. Many of them may have been borrowing instruments from the institutions and then when initial lockdown orders went into place, international students often returned home. So now don't have access to the facilities or the resources they were using from the university. So that would be one instance in which the specific types of access needs and questions for a student within my department are going to be very different from those that are being raised by someone within the biological sciences or within law or public policy. What I also think though, is that within these trainings, they would go a long way, including the principles of universal design within, which is a shift in academic settings away from an accommodations model in which individual accommodations for students, such as implementing extra time in an assignment for one student or allowing one student to use their laptop while everyone else has to take notes by hand. That model places the responsibility of disability on the individual, rather than thinking about how can we construct a learning environment that is modeled on flexibility, on generosity, and on variability, so that different students within the environment are able to encounter the learning environment as they need to or as they would want to. So you build into the system access rather than requiring a student or an educator to implement access ad hoc in like a post situation. Thinking of like the classroom environment is static and then you have to create an accommodation so that it's accessible. It's instead kind of like a complete restructuring of the classroom or learning environment so that access is built into it. And so I think that these types of trainings, if they were to um, learn from or teach the models of universal design, it would also really help to be able to isolate the types of access concerns that students and educators and administrators have and really start to make some solid solutions from like the ground up rather than thinking of them as this ad hoc solution that has to be created after the fact. Thinking then of solutions, I want to speak briefly about the role of digital technologies and tools within the pandemic response. Because as what I have been witnessing is that the utilization of digital solutions to manage pandemic disruptions and restrictions is a reflection of what disabled students and workers have been seeking and actively asking for for a really long time within educational settings. They've always been told that it's too complicated to implement these or that it creates a watered down learning or work environment, or perhaps they've been just told that the technologies simply don't exist to offer these accommodations. 
And yet, as we've seen in the rollout of remote learning and remote workplaces, in fact, when push comes to shove and the non-disabled population requires something, these various solutions can indeed be implemented and offered. So what that really then highlights for me is how historically the problem has been rooted in ableist attitudes that masquerade under phrases like equality or fairness, such as it wouldn't be fair to offer a student the chance to take classes from home while their peers have to attend in person, or it would be it wouldn't be equal for one worker to be allowed to work from home while others have to be in the office. And what I want to end on is that I think acknowledging the ways that these solutions are in fact possible and the ways they've been denied to disabled and chronically ill communities in the past raises a question about how will things look once this current moment in our history has passed? Will institutions and workplaces seek to reinstate these old rules and once again deny disabled communities the kinds of access accommodations that the pandemic has ironically in some ways provided? Or maybe this is an opportunity for institutions and workplaces to rewrite the script and shift perceptions of disability accommodation and access away from being thought of as universally negative or unequal. Could institutional and workplace regulations and expectations instead be crypt, which is a play on the term to queer? So could these expectations be crypt by the COVID-19 pandemic in ways that then offer flexibility and remote options in the future? Thank you so much, Elsa. And, you know, I realize that we've come to the end of um, our time, but I would also like to give Eleanor a chance to um, respond to the question of, of access. And this is going to be our closing statement of sorts, Eleanor. Um, but maybe you can say a couple of words about, um, you know, access from, from your perspective and um, perhaps also um, talk about how disabled people can be empowered to be actors of change in a post-pandemic world. I was just thinking, uh, Alisa was talking about access for students and that is very important. And I know here, um, a woman called Zara Baines have created a Twitter forum specifically for uh, PhD students because it's a very uh, isolating experience. And I think that's one way. Um, when it comes to digital access, um, accessibility has an, <laughs> though it solves a lot of kind of physical uh, barriers, um, I have learned from my neurodiverse uh, disabled friends that things like Zoom is not always accessible for them. And we have to learn about how to make those um, digital, so-called so digital solutions to be accessible for all. Uh, for example, this was a 19 minute um, um, webinar. Now, if I was designing this, I hope you don't mind, Suzanne, if I say, if I was designing this, I would, I would have breaks, um, comfort breaks because you know we we all need that um i think whether disabled neurodiverse or whatever so you know those that sort of things need to be built in and i am just still learning about that because when people mention access they usually mean you know like a braille or um uh, a, a sign language or you know etc etc so how do you get more disabled people or disabled women one of the things we do is we we have training sessions um, in teaching people how to be public speakers you know how how to how to just gain confidence in demanding your access rights because you know so often we've ended up being asked to speak and we find that the podium is a few steps up and when you're a wheelchair user like I am can't get there you know so that is a immediately uh, unfairness because everybody else is up there you have to speak from down there you know that that sort of um, very visual yeah 
um, ableism is that it's just people didn't think. Um, in, in the UK, we often talk about um, disabled people in parliament, in local politics, etc. That's not always been the case so easy because we need uh, we need more help in like delivering letters and all that sort of stuff. So there was a fund earlier on, but I think the government has stopped that. So we need more, maybe we need more disabled people in politics, but then we are fighting all the time because even in politics, even in um, our house of parliament, houses of parliament, you know, the, the excess isn't there. <laughs> so it's a fight, it's a battle. Um, shall I finish there? Because I think we're over time. <laughs> It's a, it's a battle is a, is a good closing statement. It's a battle, but we'll continue to fight. Um, so thank you again to all of our speakers, Luma, Elsa, Katya, and Eleanor for, um, for being here today and sharing your experiences, your expertise, and your insights with us. Um, I would like to remind everyone that we will have um, another panel, um, the third panel of this series coming up in April of this year on indigenous pathways in the time of COVID. And we will make sure that we will keep everyone who registered for this webinar um, posted on, um, on the webinar in April. Um, this panel um, was recorded um, and will be put up on YouTube um, shortly. And um, to everyone who's interested in access issues and feminism, let me also quickly mention that um, Jeremy Kelly and I are hosting a podcast, Fulbright Forward, a diversity podcast, um, where we've also um, produced episodes that um, address access issues and feminism. So um, if you're interested, um, please check it out. Um, on that note, thank you all for um, being here today, um, for, for having joined us. Um, and um, it was great talking to you and um, hope to see you in April for the third and last panel of this series. Thank you and goodbye.